The talk I'm uh, going to deliver now is uh, entitled The Regulation of Aldosterone Secretion from Physiology to Disease. And what I'm going to do is I will start from, with some uh, clinical background. I will go back then to uh, some basic uh, research um, endeavors we, uh, we were um, uh, following in the last years. And then we'll come back to some translational research um, um, uh, at, the, at the last part of my talk. Okay, I don't have to talk uh, much about the uh, primary aldosteronism by itself. It just gives this one slide to define primary aldosteronism or CON syndrome defined as autonomous hypersecretion of aldosterone, which is not caused by angiotensin II. The key clinical features you all know is arterial hypertension, hypokalemia, and metabolic alkalosis. And this whole feature was first described and then um, put um, uh, together with hyperaldosteronism from uh, Jerome Kohn. Um, certainly, autonomy is not a yes or no thing, but it's a, contin uh, a contingent from normal aldosterone towards higher aldosterone levels, which uh, uh, are followed by lower renin levels through the negative feedback um, of in the kidney. As soon as aldo aldosterone kicks in and you have the um, um, sodium retention and also fluid uh, retention, you have hypertension, and only at a later time point when sodium um, um, is uh, exchanged to potassium, we have also hypokalemia. So the, the hyperaldosteronism as the classical con syndrome is uh, then with hypokalemia, but there is also a normokalemic variant, which is maybe in the course of the disease, which is not really uh, distinguishable from essential hypertension, just on a clinical ground. Um, it was, was quite clear from the beginning that uh, primary aldosteronism comes in two flavors, if you want. One is the bilateral disease with hyperplasia of the sonar glomerulosa, a bilateral disease, and then the unilateral form with an aldosterone-producing adenoma on one side of the adrenal. So it's quite clear and it's pretty distinct. However, it's not clear whether there are, um, um, there are transitions from bilateral hyperplasia to an, uh, unilateral disease. It's also not clear what the, uh, the cause of one uh, established tumor is. And it's also not clear whether there's really maybe a precessor as an endocrine inactive tumor, which at some point then requires or gets the ability to produce aldosterone. So these kind of interactions are quite unclear and are still uh, under ongoing research. What is clear, however, and this is now, a, again, from a clinical perspective, that, um, uh, and this is part of a meta-analysis from last year, that uh, primary aldosteronism is quite common. In fact, it's the most common secondary cause of hypertension, and depending what you're looking at or what kind of uh, um, center here, primary care or referred patients in a specialized center, you have somewhere in between 5 to 10% of patients with hypertension which turn out to have um, primary aldo. So it's worthwhile to look for this. It's also worthwhile because there are clearly therapeutic consequences for the, of the diagnosis. If you have the un, unilateral form of the disease, surgical resection have, has the great chance of cure for hypokalemia in almost all cases, depending that the um, diagnosis was really uh, the correct one, and hypertension in many cases, so a cure of hypertension. And on the other hand, the bilateral form, which can be uh, quite effectively treated with um, antagonists of mineralocorticoid action, such as uh, spironolactone, for example. Um, it's also worthwhile to know whether you have primary aldo or not because aldosterone evokes a number of complications to the cardiovascular system. These are data where um, um, there is a, 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 a two groups of patients were combined with primary aldo or hypertension and independent of um, the, the grade of hypertension, you have a much higher likelihood to suffer from stroke, myocardial infarction, or atrial fibrillation uh, if you have um, uh, high levels of aldosterone in your bloodstream. Nevertheless, if you do um, correct the situation or you treat it correctly at an early time point, and these are data from the German CON registry spearheaded by Martin Reinke from our uh, institution who started this CON registry now some years ago, these are mortality data where um, uh, there, it's a comparison between hypertensive controls and primary aldosteronism. And although mortality goes down at this later time point, these are 14 years of, um, um, of observation, these differences are yet not significant. So it does make a difference if you have uh, diagnosed the disease and you treated it correctly, um, it makes all sense. <clears throat> 
Now we're coming uh, rather to open question and aims, and it, uh, let me boil this down to only one um, line here, the identification of biomarker and targets. And I realize this is, of course, a very broad scheme, and it uh, relates also to all kind, other kind of um, 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 scientific fields, but if you had biomarkers, you would be able for, to early detect patients with primary aldosteronism. Maybe even more importantly in this regard, you had a non-invasive uh, way to, for subtype, subtype differentiation of unilateral or bilateral disease, avoiding, for example, invasive catheterization. And if you had targets, it was of, would of course be nice to have some kind of um, maybe personalized pharmacological intervention. Now let's turn to the basic research part. Um, I put here down some examples for experimental strategies. One would be um, the investigation of molecular mechanisms resulting in autonomous aldosterone secretion, and one another would be to find genetic contributors of aldosterone autonomy. And I do realize, of course, there is some overlap, but for the sake of the talk, let's keep these two separated. Let's start with molecular mechanisms, and here again, it's a good starting point to investigate the physiology of aldosterone regulation, because you would argue, if you would understand this, and you would go further into autonomous aldosterone secretion, and I give you two examples here. Um, let's start with physiology, what is known for quite some time, what's going on in the sonar glomerulosa cell <coughs> within the adrenal cortex, which produces the aldosterone. And this is an oversimplification of the scheme here with the angiotensin receptor, and angiotensin binds to its receptor through a number of events. <coughs> in the end, it uh, uh, turns out to have an increase of intracellular calcium through liberation of intracellular uh, stores from the endoplasmatic reticulum, but also from influx from the outside of the cell, which then turns intracellular calcium at a higher level. And this triggers the chain of events, starting with calmodulin, which then phosphorylates a number of different CAM kinases, which then trigger uh, induction of uh, a number of transcription factors, and that bind then to the um, five prime uh, part of the sub 11 b 2 um, gene, which encodes the aldosterone synthase, and aldosterone synthase is one of the major and specific rate-limiting steps for aldosterone secretion. So we did some uh, experiments some time ago. Simona Hackmann was, uh, Sackmann was doing this, I'm sorry, um, and she was looking for chem kinases, protein contents, and also phosphorylation. You see there's some difference for aldosterone using adenomas here in black in comparison to normal adrenal glands, a little bit higher levels of chem kinase 1, also phosphorylation of chem case 2, which is associated with phosphorylation of CREP. But this, of course, is only a snapshot, and it's quite difficult to, um, to make this, uh, these really distinctions when you compare uh, tumorous disease with normal adrenal gland. So we went on, and this is uh, work from Ariadne Spiroklu from the lab, where she um, did, well, somewhat an, an easy experiment, but it, it was not easy at all because it uh, involved a number of, uh, of animals of different groups. Uh, these were wild-type mice. They got a sham injection, and then she was looking at baseline after 10, 20, 30, and so on minutes, and she was looking for aldosterone output and for the adrenals and for, for their uh, transcriptional profile. And this was only the control group, and she did the same then with angiotensin 2 and also with sodium chloride to induce a kind of simulation experiment and also suppression test. And first, if you look... If we look now at uh, aldosterone output, uh, just plasma aldosterone, these are at, this is at baseline and then at different time points. You see here the control animals. If they were stressed <coughs> by handling and by putting a needle in their belly, which was certainly not very pleasant, you see an induction of HBA axis and uh, ACTH-dependent increase of aldosterone, which has been described earlier on. This is a little bit, and this is the same here with the sodium injection. You see this increase, and it goes down, and after a longer period of time, sodium does a little bit of uh, suppression of aldosterone secretion. This is quite remarkably different. If you uh, take angiotensin II, this, you see this nice and very swift response of the adrenal, um, which secretes then aldosterone. Uh, then, now looking at the adrenal gland itself and at expression um, levels of some um, candidate genes we were interested in, here's first serogenic enzymes. This is STAR, CB11A1, the sidechain cleavage enzyme, CB11B2, the aldosterone synthase. 
sham, angiotensin and sodium chloride. And you see the difference here between sham and angiotensin II is not in star and um, CYP11A1. This looks pretty much the same. But if you concentrate here on the black bars, CYP11B2, these are only upregulated and already at very early time points after angiotensin II stimulation. If you turn towards uh, the sodium chloride, this was able to actually block and decrease over baseline expression all those different steogenic enzymes. So quite remarkable changes in which came about at very early time points. Uh, now let's turn back to this uh, scheme again. I was talking about NUR1 and NGFYB as some of the transcription factors which turn on or off uh, CYP11P2 expression. If you look now for these transcription factors, and those data actually came mainly from in vitro results. We were interested in what would happen in the in vivo situation. And you have here NGFIB, the black one, the dark one, and NUR1. You see there is no really difference in NGFIB expression independent of the stimulation experiment. But this looks quite different for NUR1, quite different for NUR1, where there's barely any increase in, in the sham and the sodium chloride um, treated animals, but there's a very nice increase by angiotensin 2 indicating that's actually new one, at least in the setting of angiotensin II dependent aldosterone secretion, which makes the difference. Um, two groups were, sh uh, were looking for NGFIB and, uh, and NUR1 expression in um, uh, aldosterone producing adenomas, and just to, uh, like to point out this down here. This is a correlation of CYP11B2 expression and NUR1 expression, and the same with CYP1 and NGFIB, and a, uh, um, um, a nice correlation between those two um, expression parameters were found only for NUR1, but it was quite weak for NGFIB. Again, indicating that also maybe in the context of uh, autonomy autonomous aldosterone secretion, no one is upstream and might uh, modulate um, the disease uh, state here. Okay, so, and another experiment similar, um, this was done by Alexander Dirks and Urs Lichtenau in the lab, it, uh, different in two regards. One was that the secretagogue here was actually potassium and not angiotensin II, that was one different, and the other different was that it was a long-term uh, experiment, a control group, a group with low potassium, and a group with high potassium. And the, the reason we did this experiment was not to look into specific candidate genes, but this time to screen a uh, transcriptome profile and maybe find new candidates which are involved in aldosterone secretion. And that's what we did. We did this gene profile experiment. We see this in nice increase of uh, here aldosterone, um, CYP11B2 expression in the adrenal, actually with what we thought in the beginning that there would be some remodeling of the sonar glomerulosa we did not find. So mainly what we're looking at are now more or less transcriptional changes. And as always, you get tons of data out of this, and you have to make some kind of order. We looked through this from, from different angles, but I'm going to concentrate now only though to those genes which were significantly upregulated upon high potassium intake. Uh, and then what we did, we, we took some candidate genes and we went into an in vitro system. This is uh, work in NCI H295 cells. It's an adrenocortical cell line which makes, among other steroids, also aldosterone. It works quite nicely also for PA research, if you, if you like, because by, by an increase of potassium, we see a nice increase of aldosterone output from those cells. Also endogenous CYP11B2, which is uh, very nicely induced. And this works also with the promoter luciferase um, uh, construct, which was transfected on those cells uh, also. So we were looking at uh, at least a number of those candidate genes, and not all, from, all of them, but some of them did show also in this in vitro situation a potassium-induced upregulation, indicating that it's actually a direct potassium effect, and it's not something which is evoked in vivo by potassium intake through some indirect mechanisms. And then again, we were um, um, uh, turning towards the um, con adenomas. And you would argue that you would like to see some of those candidate genes to be upregulated in your con adenomas, because then you could argue that at least it gives you some, um, some hinge that uh, these might be causative events um, um, in this particular setting. And um, as you see here with the green um, uh, signs here, that uh, at least some of those candidate genes were upregulated in con adenomas. Of course, a lot of work would need to be done here on a mechanistic state, but I would argue that these would be good starting points uh, as targets to look into, uh, to further look into mechanisms here. All right. <clears throat> this was molecular mechanisms. Now I turn to genetic contributors, and I give you two examples here. Um, we start out again with mouse uh, um, um, experiments, 
and uh, I show more data, again from Ariadne Spiroglu, from a mutagenesis screen. How is this working? Mutagenesis screen, you use a mutagenetic substance, Inu, what it's called. We made use of an already ongoing mutagenesis screen and a health health center in Munich. Um, Inu is then uh, used to treat uh, male animals, and uh, which uh, acquire then a number of point mutation. Um, they are uh, all over the genome, randomly um, um, over the genome. They are also in spermatogonia, which means if you made these inotreated male animals with wild-type female mice, you will get offsprings which have all kinds of point mutations, and some of them then you look for a particular phenotype. You could look for body weight, for long whiskers, for fewer uh, color or whatever. We were looking for high aldosterone levels. And we would use those to breed them further, and in the end you would uh, have the possibility to do phenotypical um, uh, characterization, also have uh, mouse models for maybe interventional studies, and importantly in this uh, regard here, uh, to have animals for genetic evaluation to find then the underlying genetic event which led to this phenotype. Uh, that's what we did, and when you start an, a project like this, you have to be really sure what you are measuring, not only from the, your assay perspective, but also you have to define normal values, and that's what we did. We used these particular um, um, background uh, inbred mice. Um, we realized that there are lots of difference in aldosterone levels at baseline between line uh, A and line B. So these uh, were done not only between the genders, but also at particular time points, at 12 weeks of age and 16 weeks of age. And the reason for this was that uh, we tested uh, then the, the Eno offsprings at this, these two particular time points. Um, to rather define this moving target of high aldosterone, we defined a cutoff value, which was two, two standard deviation above the mean, and then hundreds and hundreds of mice were screened, uh, Inu mice, and aldosterone was measured, and only those which were above these uh, ranges, these different um, gender-dependent ranges, they were tested again after four weeks, and only those which again showed high aldosterone levels were then used for further breeding. And this leads to this uh, top-down pyramid, so to say, uh, very diligently uh, measurement of aldosterone was required, 2,800 somewhat mice were screened, 80, uh, 38 out of these um, showed initially high aldosterone levels, only, elf, uh, sorry, only 11 were uh, later on then um, um, still um, those which had sustained aldosterone levels, two animals were dying in course, so we had nine founders and we had in the end, we were lucky enough to had, have uh, eight established lines. Then we were looking for the pedigrees of those. See uh, again a number of uh, animals, these are different lines. Um, you see the black uh, parts here, these are affected animals and you see immediately that you have these uh, um, going through the different um, um, generations and you have something which is, seems to be genetically fixed here in these different pedigrees. The nice thing on this is that to have eight different lines, they were actually from eight different founders, means it's very likely that you have eight at least, or at the most, I should say, at the most eight different genes which affect this, uh, particular, uh, this particular phenotype. So then we did start uh, with some uh, morphological and functional data. Of course, aldosterone levels were high in the so-called affected ones, but of course this was the, um, the, the, um, the phenotype we were looking at, aldosterone high, but what was not clear from the, from the beginning that actually those animals with high aldosterone levels had at least tendency towards lower renin levels, which uh, indicates that this is a primary aldosteronism just from the screening approach. It had, could have been also that we find uh, secondary hyperaldosteronism mice. Then accordingly, aldosterone renin ratio are higher in the affected animals, and also potassium, at least in female mice, tend to be lower. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it uh, fits to the phenotype of a primary aldosteronism. We were then looking for the, at the adrenal itself. We did a number of morphological, uh, morphometric analysis, and we, uh, what, we, what we could uh, quantify here, we see his, uh, here as an example, this is an unaffected animal, an affected one, and you see this, you can appreciate that the glomerulosa width is uh, thicker than in the unaffected one, and this is also reflected here 
In this immunosochemistry, these are unaffected animals, normal aldosterone levels, these are affected one, high aldosterone levels, and you can again appreciate that CYP11B2 expression is markedly enhanced in these uh, animals. This goes uh, hand in hand with a higher expression on the mRNA level for CYP11B2, which is not the case for SCC, and even an, a reverse uh, decrease in, in the star, indicating you have something which turns on CYP11B2. So far, so good. Now, uh, of course, the, the part where we started this, and this is, uh, gets then much more complicated, and it's still an, an open quest, the quest for this particular gene. This is a locus that we found in one of the lines through linkage analysis, where you have to do a uh, uh, we have to breed out uh, those animals to different generations and then do linkage analysis. We found a locus on chromosome 9, but you can see immediately that it's much too large with many, many genes involved, and there are just too many to handle them. I brought you a list here. So we uh, turned toward uh, exon sequencing, which I'm going to talk later on in another context again. Uh, we did identify it now around 20 genes, harboring point mutations in affected animals, but um, the problem is that you have to go through all of those and do, uh, in the end, also functional studies because ENU, as a reminder, induces, of course, a lot of point mutations that are expected and might not relate at all to the phenotype. So there's still a lot of work ahead. Okay, now I come to translational strategies, and I think they are also at least as important as the more base, uh, basic research approaches, and I'm going to give you mainly two examples. And one I'm going to touch very briefly, only two slides, and not going to really data here, but one uh, very powerful approach is to use the genome-wide association study. And we did this in a, a population-based study, uh, study uh, the CORA platform, Aux uh, Augsburg, southern Germany, where here 1,800 subjects were screened and they were, um, they were subjected to this uh, genome-wide association study. And then we measured aldosterone to renin ratio in those subjects and correlated those with uh, the genetic information, which you see here in this Manhattan plot, a very nice peak at chromosome 5, which is associated with difference in aldosterone renin ratio. And this is uh, just the second slide, also to give me the chance to uh, show Tarek Butsoklu, who took on this, experiment, uh, this particular uh, project, to go into the details of those genes which are harbored in this particular context and to put this in an in vitro system and also uh, uh, to look into uh, a knockout model. But I'm not going to have the time to talk about these uh, further on. Now let's have, a, and again, a bit more of a clinical view. If you think about your differential diagnosis of primary aldosteronism in a classical form, say, you have to deal with at least uh, four or maybe even, even uh, more different varieties. As I alluded out earlier, you have the, uh, the unilateral form, the aldosterone-producing adenoma. You have the bilateral form, the so-called idiopathic adrenal hyperplasia, maybe some much more rare, at least in Europe, rare, varieties with a macronodular shape, and then you have the, the familiar forms. If you look into uh, the numbers, it turns out quite uh, uh, easily that uh, with hypokalemic patients, you have somewhat the likelihood uh, to have 70% of those patients having a unilateral form, 30% a bilateral form, and very rarely you have familiar forms. However, I would like to focus on this part for a particular reason, because I think you can learn a lot from very rare uh, uh, variants and uh, very rare forms also for the general uh, part of the disease. So the field of genetics of primary aldosteronism with, uh, uh, was introduced by Rick Lifton um, in 1992 in Nature work, uh, um, published in Nature, which uh, they, where they identified the then later coined form familiar hyperaldosteronism type 1, short FH1, also called glucocorticoid remain uh, hyperaldosteronism, and the reason or the, or the cause of this, the genetic cause of this disease, is a, chim uh, a chimeric gene of ACTH-dependent CYP11B1. This is the promoter part, which is then fused to the very closely related CYP11B2, which is otherwise, as you know, all know now, angiotensin 2 dependent. And what you, what you uh, get with this uh, chimeric gene is an ACTH-dependent upregulation of aldosterone, and you take out this uh, gene then out of the, this normal context of uh, renin angiotensin uh, related regulation, and this um, fuels then your autonomy. It was quite clear after some uh, time that there are certainly other forms of uh, um, familiar forms of um, um, primary aldo, so-called then FH2. 
Um, they are distinctive from FH1, um, for example, as they are not suppressible by glucocorticoids. They could also be easily then genetically tested, and it became clear this is not this traumatic gene. Um, and, um, and in some families, in, for example, Australia, a particular locus in chromosome 7p22 could be asso associated with um, um, the disease, but so far the hunt for the gene has been uh, frustrating. And one of the reasons is that this is certainly a heterogeneous group of patients there. If anything, uh, it underlines a number of different genetic events and maybe even um, particular um, genetic hits for each family. And this is an example of a large family that we have in our center. This was put together by Anna Pallow von Caroline Schirpenbach, um, where you see there are affected uh, members in this, uh, in this uh, rather big uh, family over different generations. So this is not just luck. There has to be some genetic background. But again, we were not yet able to define the genetic mechanisms behind this particular family. Okay, the, the field was then uh, quite moved over then in uh, 2008 and then in 2011, as I'll show you in a minute, when another form uh, called then FH3 was described, again, non-suppressible by glucocorticoids. It was an initial description by David Geller, uh, who described a boy with a very severe phenotype, very low potassium levels, very high um, hypertension. It was an early onset. It showed a particular steroid secretion pattern of different uh, 18 uh, oxocortisol and hydroxycortisol, uh, which was uh, quite clear, or it, uh, at least it uh, was good evidence that this is a particular phenotype. It was 2011 that again Rick Lifton was, uh, and his group was able uh, to identify the underlying genetic cause, a mutation in one particular potassium channel, which I'll show you in a minute. And here we come back to uh, pathways. Now we are further up at the membrane again. Um, this is the situation in, the, uh, in a normal glomerulosa cell. I would like to point out another particular uh, mechanism in a glomerulosa cell, and this is that these cells are particularly hyperpolarized. They have a hyperpolarized membrane potential if they are in a resting state. And if angiotensin II binds, uh, there is a blockage of a potassium channel, which leads to, decrease, to a decrease of potassium through efflux of potassium through this particular channel. This uh, uh, triggers depolarization of the cell. This triggers influx of calcium and then the further chain of events that I alluded uh, earlier to. Now, what they found was a particular mutation in uh, not only this gene, but in a very um, specific portion of this gene. It's called a selectivity filter. This, these are representative um, potassium ions which, which are flowing out of the cell. And if you have uh, acquired um, mutations in this or nearby this so-called selectivity filter, what happens is that you have uh, not only potassium fitting through this channel, but it's also sodium. And sodium then flows in into the cell independent of any angiotensin II um, stimulation. You have the depolarization and then the remaining um, chain of events. So this was a certainly um, a very important finding in 2011. And here comes Europe. Um, the European uh, Network for the Study of Arterial Tumors uh, is an absolutely outstanding example for how uh, European countries can uh, work together and bring about uh, really a difference. And I would like to point out here Maria Cristina Senaro from Paris, um, who um, spearheaded this uh, particular experiment. So we were able, within a, a number of NSAID centers, to collect very fast and rapid um, biomaterial from patients with primary aldo. These were all patients who had the uh, unilateral form of disease, which underwent surgery, uh, where we had uh, good uh, clinical data and uh, which um, where we had also biomaterial. So we ended up with uh, 380 patients, so quite large group, and uh, we were pleased to see that a very large number for one particular gene and only in two different uh, loci of this uh, gene were affected uh, by casein 5 mutations. So all of a sudden explaining one third of autonomy of cases with uh, an uh, autonomous aldosterone secretion. And then we were able also to look into uh, clinical endpoints. I uh, uh, only, sorry, only point out um, uh, two things. One is that, so these are patients which are mutation carriers. These are without mutations, and you see that they are younger, and it's more, much more likely these are the number of females or the percentage of females. It's much more likely that you have a female person, a person who has this uh, uh, mutation. 
This is, uh, again, shown here, percentage of mutations over different age uh, years uh, or age groups. You see this decrease over time with, uh, so the less uh, like, the, le the older you are, the less likely you will find a case in G5 mutations, and through all those uh, age groups, it's much more likely to find this in female here in dark uh, in um, uh, comparison to uh, aged match, uh, matched um, male patients. So this was the first example that there would, there is some, there are some subgroups uh, uh, within the um, um, group of, of um, aldosterone-producing adenomas. 2012 was really, in that regard, the year of KCN G5. A number of different uh, groups put together their cases. In the end, there were around 1,000 cases. Still, this number of KCN G5 positive um, uh, cases uh, was kept up at about 38%, only with very few exceptions. It was uh, pretty much the same throughout different continents throughout the world. So, again, very impressive, 38.8% of cases who have casein G5 mutations, but you can turn this the other way around, of course. It means you have around 60% uh, of cases where it's not explained. And that was the starting point when we, when we did uh, another exome sequencing project, and here I would like to point out Andrea Oswald, again Martin Reinke from... Uh, from Munich, but this was clearly a, a joint a group effort with Tim Strom, who did the exome sequencing, Bento Wilson from Aarhus, and Richard Ward, who did uh, a lot of the uh, in vitro results I'm going to present you in a second. So the starting point of this exome sequencing, again, came from clinics. It, come from, it came from clinical annotations, and it came from biomaterial. We only started with nine patients, and we uh, hand-picked them in that we tried to make them as uh, homogenous as possible. They were all male patients. They had all the severe form of primary aldof with hypokalemia, um, and partly very severe hypokalemia. And importantly, of course, we did not want to find uh, the case in G5 mutation it's, uh, again, so they were all without case in G5 mutations, and we had enough biomaterial. So we did exome sequencing, and of course we were quite pleased to find, uh, if you see these kind of exper um, um, results, three out of nine patients, a third, had point mutations in ATP1A1, what I'm talking about uh, in a second, and two out of, uh, uh, further two out of those nine patients had a, a mutation, point mutation, in a very uh, closely related gene, ATP2B3. So what are these two genes, ATP1A1? encodes the sodium-potassium ATPase, a uh, gene, of course, well-known in uh, energy metabolism. Sodium-potassium ATPase is required for a, a number of things, but is certainly the primary step for energy-dependent generation of membrane potential. And how does it do, does this? By uh, um, using ATPase and the energy in ATPase is exchanges free cytoplasmatic sodium out of the cell, exchanges with potassium, which comes in the cell, which then generates intracellular electronegativity. It was quite interesting that also already here in a, in a very nice review from 2004, uh, sodium-potassium ATPase was already described <coughs> based on a number of in vitro experiments as an angiotensin II target in that angiotensin II can block the action or at least reduce the action um, of the sodium-potassium ATPase. And if you think about this, this reducing activity of the sodium pump would then dissipate a potassium gradient and result in depolarization just by decreasing the um, activity of this um, ATPase. So that's uh, ATP1A1. ATP2B3 is a part of a very uh, closely related group of genes which uh, also have pump abilities, but they have another substrate. They have calcium. They uh, exclude calcium from the cytoplasma out of the cell. So whenever, whenever calcium is increased through, for example, for the chromolosa cell, through angiotensin action, um, these pumps are in place to remove calcium and to make the cell ready to start over with an activity phase again. So you could easily imagine if you have a point mutation which um, affects this, cal this ability to exclude calcium, you have an increase of intracellular calcium. Um, so we did find hotspots in both of those, those genes here in this, uh, in this region. It was the, very much the same hotspot in ATP1A1 and also in ATP2B3. So not only two genes which are uh, highly um, 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 related, but also mutations which were highly related if you want. Here for ATP1A1, just an example, those uh, amino acids which were um, affected by these mutations were also highly conserved among species. 
We found also another hotspot in the very much uh, more N-terminal part of the ATV1A1 gene. So it seems uh, at, at this uh, sketch, they seem quite unrelated. However, if you look at the three-dimensional structure, which is shown here for ATV1A1, uh, so you see immediately that this yellow and this uh, um, uh, reddish um, uh, residues, amino acids, they are in fact very much close together. They have uh, very close uh, boundaries, and they have been shown earlier on in vitro experiments with uh, where, um, point mutations were introduced to this gene that uh, these amino acids are required for the handling of the potassium uh, to the ATPase. Um, so when we looked at our European sample, uh, the numbers did come down. They were In the end, there were 7% of patients who were uh, affected by this mutation, and we did see a number of differences between the different centers, which is by itself interesting. It might relate to certainly a kind of selection bias. In Munich, we have um, rather uh, patients with the uh, with low potassium variant, and um, which is not the case in other centers. Um, what, what turned out in, uh, in uh, difference to the case in G5 story is that we had much more males actually affected by this uh, particular mu mutation in comparison to females. That was one um, difference. i come to a, a further clinical difference in a second. We went then on uh, for in vitro studies. So we introduced this um, um, point mutation in the ATPase 1A1 uh, in a uh, heterologous cell line. We see here, this is ATPase activity, this is the wild type, and it goes down almost to nothing uh, in, uh, as soon as you introduce um, um, those um, point mutations. And you see also, as would have been uh, predicted by just the structure of the gene, that you have a re reduced affinity for potassium. Um, sorry, this is up here. As soon as you introduce uh, the the point mutation. We were lucky enough also to have the opportunity to look into um, um, more, um, into a more, if you want, relevant system because here we were able to uh, grow um, uh, con adenomas as a primary in a primary culture and then do a number of experiments where we could show here. So these are these are adjacent normal, if you want, adrenal cells. These were from adrenal adenoma without a norm mutation. These were adrenal adenoma cells with case in G5 and these black ones with ATP1, A1, and 2B3 mutations. You see here uh, uh, quite nicely that you have this, what you would have predicted, an increased depolarization in those adenoma cells which harbor the endogenous. Uh, mutation, and we could also recapitulate this again in the uh, heterological uh, cell line. So coming back to the clinic, <clears throat> now we were able to have three groups. Uh, we have the case in 5 ATPase negative group, those with case in 5 those with ATPase, and you see here only a few things again. Age at diagnosis was uh, um, roughly 10 years older for the ATPase uh, uh, patients, 40 years for case in 5 and somewhere in, somewhere in between for those where we do not know the uh, genetic uh, hit yet. Uh, this is age. I also showed you that there are more males affected than females, but also uh, more relevant um, uh, endpoints from a clinical perspective. The lowest recorded serum potassium was, in fact, the lowest for ATPase uh, patients and higher for case in 5 uh, Aldosterone, plasma aldosterone was higher in comparison to the other groups, and systolic plus blood pressure also at baseline was higher, significantly higher than in comparison to the other group. Okay, um, now it's almost the end. We have uh, now a better understanding of the regulation of aldosterone secretion. I have introduced some of the uh, uh, pretty new and very new players in the system. Um, I have shown you or have told you that hyperpolarization is a very important um, um, uh, functional um, um, uh, um, characterization of glomerulosa cells. Uh, I have shown you that if angiotensin II binds through a number of different uh, effects, depolarization um, comes into play, increase of intracellular calcium, which then through a number of uh, transcription factors turns on aldosterone. So this is still physiology. And then just to put this together as in cartoon, if you have the mutation in KCNG5, increase of uh, sodium depolarization and triggering of the event, you can have the same with the mutation of sodium potassium ATPase with an increase of intracellular sodium and depolarization. But there might, by the way, still be other mechanisms which are also involved in this uh, particular mutations. 
And you have the same effect, but on a different angle here, on a different layer. If you have mutations in the calcium ATPase, you cannot get rid of your intracellular calcium. And then again, you have the trigger of those events. So to summarize, I, there, are, there has been significant process, just uh, progress in the elucidation of molecular and genomic mechanisms. On, uh, this has been true also just for uh, the remaining, say, five or so years. There are now genetic molecular determinants of primary ALDO, which do explain the pathophysiological cause of aldosterone secretion in a growing number of also sporadic uh, um, con adenomas. They do define some aspects of associated clinical phenotypes, but there might, of course, be others and which might be more telling in that regard. Uh, they could provide new targets and biomarkers for diagnosis and therapy in PA, and then it's uh, going to be quite interesting for, uh, from a clinical perspective. Certainly, nevertheless, additional genetic and molecular key players responsible for this uh, disease, which I would like to point out, and again, is the most prevalent form of secondary hypertension, are very likely to be determined in the near future. So, I have to thank a number of uh, people. Uh, some are highlighted here. These are lab members over now a, a, already a period of time. I did highlight a number of those if they were, have been involved uh, in particular studies, um, but I have to thank all of them for their dedication and uh, um, their uh, good vibration to the lab. It's really a, a, a tremendous uh, honor and pleasure to work or have been worked with them uh, together. The second one goes to the more clinical part. This is, uh, these are now members, so to say, of the German Con Registry. Unfortunately, not all of them, because we never come together as a group, really, at least uh, not if a photograph is out there. The, the German Con Registry is also has input from a, no a number of other uh, German centers. I just put out here from Würzburg, Berlin, and Düsseldorf. There are a number of contributors for, I'm only here uh, highlighting those which, had, which I had the time to show you data from the European um, perspective coming to Europe. These are European friends. I was alluding to the European Network for the Study of Internal Tumor. Very viable and very, very powerful uh, endeavor. And uh, we were talking about the power of Europe. This is as you stay united. This is a very, very good example and uh, uh, a very powerful uh, approach. There's NSAID cancer. This is another variety of NSAID where we have an FP7 um, consortium. This was uh, just a meeting two weeks ago in Nice which was very nice and it looked quite happy in the sun here. Then, um, of course, I have to thank um, a number of uh, mentors and friends, and there's certainly an end here. It's not only mentors, but they have, we have grown to friends over now many years, and this is Bruno Alolio, Martin Reinke, Gary Hammer, who told me all, uh, I, uh, I taught me all I, I know about uh, clinical and translational and basic research, all related to adrenal fields, but also with very many other interests in endocrinology. I'm very, very honored and glad to have, uh, um, have the same path. Speaking of path, here's Wiebke Alt and Martin Fassner, too. Um, I have a, a very long history now through all of my career. Uh, Wiebke is always a little bit uh, uh, up ahead. You saw in this list, she was uh, four years earlier the recipient of this award, and it would actually only be vaguely surprised that at some point Martin Fassner is also going to stand here and give you a lecture in the future. And finally, certainly not the uh, last but not least, I'm very much indebted to my family, this is Jakob, Heike, and Pauline. Without their daily support and their so far endless patience, I would not stand here. Thank you very much.